Hello everyone, and I'm sure a lot of you are surprised to be straight on and into the bushwalk this afternoon. My name is Scott, and I'm teamed up with jean on camera. It's so good to be back out here on the bush, in the bush rather, but on foot. And it's a windy afternoon, quite hot, but really looking forward to searching for some of the smaller things, possibly, but we may bump into some large and potentially dangerous animals as well along the way. We've come into this area in the hope that we may be able to track down Tingana, a big male leopard whose tracks were heading into this direction this morning. I'm guessing it was him. We must always be careful not to always be certain of our guesses out here, but I'm fairly certain it was Tingana who was snooping around this area. And we're going to continue to walk around checking the game trails, but we're going to be very cautious. If it is your first bush walk, um, be calm. Don't be too panicked, even though there are potential threats out here. I'm trained. I've spent a lot of time in the bush on foot and we shouldn't run into any trouble. It's highly unlikely. I've brought one very important tool along that I'm going to explain to you immediately and it's going to give, a, give you a good idea of how windy it is. And this is an ash bag. The wind's blowing so quickly that it's actually taking the ash away before you even can see where it's going. But it's kind of swirling around <laughs> in all directions which means we need to be extra cautious. When animals get startled is when they're most dangerous. And this is an example of how you may startle animals if it's very windy and you're walking through the bush. They may not hear your footsteps because of the ambient noise from all the wind. On top of that, they may smell you before you get to them. And that could have positive or negative uh, results or cause the animal to do different things. But we know what we're doing and we're just going to keep creeping along through this area. It's a great thrill and very energizing to be on foot. And we're going to be searching for, like I said, not only big dangerous animals, but mainly smaller things that you would oversee when you're stuck in a vehicle. And just to let you know, Jamie is also out. She's swapped vehicles. She's jumped into a vehicle with more reliable signal this afternoon in the vehicle that I was in. And that will hopefully mean that she's not going to have as many signal breakups as she did have this morning. I'm not too sure exactly what her plans are, but she's heading out with Tebs on camera. And it's Tara and Jerry in the final control room. Well, quite often we drive past this grass, but you may not realize exactly how tall it is. Now, I'm basically six foot. And this piece of grass is just about matching my height. It's called red thatching grass, and it's the longest grass we get in this area. After the exceptionally dry weather we've been having, though, it's kind of fallen down and withered away. This used to be thick, and I wouldn't really walk through here in summer normally, but because it's a drought conditions that we're experiencing at the moment, it'll be okay to meander our way through here. One thing that I forgot to chat about is this guinea fowl feather. And what's interesting about it is that you can actually tell that because of this midrib not being in the center of the feather, I can assume that it's from the right wing. So I'm going to turn it over. This is how the guinea fowl would be flying with it usually. And because this is this feather's been right on the front of the right wing. It's been hitting branches when it lands in trees, and that's why it's almost shaved. The frontal feather is very short, whereas the feathers at the back over here still remain long. So it's from the front part of the right wing of the guinea fowl, and beautiful little spots on the feathers. I love the guinea fowl. They're such cool birds, and I thought you would really enjoy taking a closer look at this feather. There's just hundreds of them on the guinea fowls usually, so hard to understand exactly what they look like. Anyway, we're going to leave that here. Something may use it to build a nest at this time of the year. A lot of the birds will be collecting other birds' feathers or other animals' fur to line their nests with. And that there may provide a very useful bedding for a little family of birds. 
It's important to remember that when in nature, it's best to leave only your footprints where possible. That's in an ideal world, of course. And oh, I think there's something just up ahead of us here. It's nothing to be worried about, though. It's just a warthog. And it may just be possible for Jandre to race you in there. He's done a great job. It's extremely difficult handling a camera with absolutely nothing to assist you other than your two hands. No monopod or tripod or clever gizmo helping to stabilize the shots. And on top of that, he's not only worried about the camera, but he's also got a massive backpack on with a long antenna pole sticking out of it. So, well done, Jandre, and I'm glad we got a glimpse of those warthog. As I was saying, now, in an ideal world, we will always try and leave only our footprints when in nature. So, even picking up something as small as a feather, especially at this time of the year, could have an impact on another animal's life. We often only take into consideration the big animals, but tend to forget about the small animals who have equally important lives to live. It's a very hot afternoon, 33 degrees Celsius, which is about 91 degrees Fahrenheit. And just to give you an idea of what we need to watch out for while we're walking along here, you wouldn't want to step on one of these thorns, would you? These are thorns from the flaky bark acacia. And look at how big they are. Some of them are as long as my finger. And interestingly enough, ants actually, here's a good example of one here. It's not going to be easy though, but ants often, let me break this one off. Ants will actually often bite these little thorns and it creates an, an increase in growth of the thorn, kind of an abnormally larger. Amount of growth, and ants can live within the cavities that have grown around. their irritations and this afternoon to Jen. Welcome to the bushwalk and thanks for sending your question through. Jen's wondering if I use any kind of repellents to make sure the insect insects and ticks and parasites don't jump onto me and actually um, I haven't found any that are very, very effective in keeping ticks away. And anything that probably is effective is probably harmful to our skin or to our body.
and that's the resulting kind of bite, nothing too serious but a bit itchy. Um, so there we go Jen, I, I don't, but some guides do. Anyway, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome to the drive portion of your safari this afternoon. For those of you, I hear that Scott is showing you his war wounds from ticks. And I would show you mine, but most of them on my feet. I'm short of contorting myself to put my foot on the dashboard, which I just showing you his war wounds from ticks. And I would show you mine, but most of them on my feet. I'm short of contorting myself. crow flies an hour closer to the Drakensberg Mountains and I guess that it must have, or those mountains must have sheltered us from the brunt of the wind that comes through here because it is much much windier in, on Juma and Arethusa than I've ever experienced. knob thorn on the right and a buffalo thorn on the left.
guinea guinea fowl. Sorry. Well, we do apologize for the brief break in signal. We're back up and running once again. I've just spied our old buffalo friend. Now, I'm not sure if you were watching that wonderful red, red bull horn bull sighting. I don't know why this is so difficult to say. It shouldn't have been. Not the first time I've ever had to say it. But he was busy rooting through all of that old elephant dung to pick up termites. And then at one point shot into the air, caught something. I don't know if it was maybe a small butterfly or maybe a big fly. He managed to nab something out of mid-air, seemingly without paying attention. Now, I knew a wonderful guy called Matthew at the place that I used to work. And Matthew was a gate guard, but he really, really wanted to be a guide. And one of the things I used to do was to give him my old guiding reference book so that he could complete the course. And one day we had a long conversation, because I've always said that Moonbills are a little bit... Um, short on the brain side, let's put it that way. And he was very quick to beat me down and say no, he'd raised a hornbill by hand when he was a little bit younger and it was his absolute best friend who'd fallen out of the nest. He couldn't return it to its parents, so he raised this thing by hand and it was incredibly intelligent. That was Matthew's version of it anyway. Just popping down here, let's go have a look at our old buffalo bull. I have Tibbs on the back of, of the vehicle with me operating the camera and Tibbs has just joined the Wild Earth team. So Antique Laura Croft. Tibbs, when did you join? It was a, was it been a week? Less than a week. Tibbs has been with us for less than a week. She can't honestly remember which day it was and that's nothing against Tibbs. It's just my days of the week are not very good. My days sometimes blend into one, but he's been doing a fantastic job so far, even on times when the buffalo don't want to cooperate. I want to pop down and see if we can spot a yellow-billed hornbill. Oh, not a yellow-billed hornbill. Yellow-billed ox picker. That's what I'm after. And our group of Duggar boys. And then my plan is to head up to Buffalton Dam because I think that's where the elephants have gone. As I said, or as I was talking about, it's very, very warm this afternoon. That cold front appears to have disappeared. Fortunately, it really didn't bring any rain with it, which I'm quite disappointed by. I honestly thought it was going to. You'd think with all that snow and stuff on the mountain it might have caused a bit of precipitation on our side, but it didn't. Hello, Buffalo. Stopping to have a bit of a sniff and a conference. I wonder what they're saying to each other. Oh. He didn't appreciate whatever it was. He's off. <laughs> and as one of the most water-dependent creatures out here, we see them pretty much all the time around this dam, searching for water. Lucky for them, the water hole is pumped, so there's always a supply. But it's still hard times for all of the animals out here, which is why I was hoping so much for rain. There are those beautiful red-billed ox pickers. Doesn't look like there's a yellow build amongst them just yet, but you can see them mouths wide open because they're hot as well. They're all panting. Now we get the yellow build and the red build, but I'm not sure if any of you have seen ox pickers with a dark bull. 
and that is a juvenile ox pecker, both the red bulls and the yellow bulls. The juveniles have almost black bulls. Something that looks very strange when you're used to the bright red of the adults. Hello boy. Beautiful old buffalo bull. They carry a certain amount of dignity when they're this age and that's thick base at the bottom of their horns, known as the boss. And they definitely come with a temperament as well. They're not the friendliest creatures when they reach this stage of their lives. I think I'm going to leave these gentlemen to go and have their wallow in the water and see what else we can find. I'm going to head on up to Buffalo's Hook Dam. And buffle, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the terminology around here, this is a buffle. A buffle, actually. In Afrikaans, the name for buffalo. So Buffalo's Hook Dam is the Buffalo Corner Dam. While I head across to Buffalo Corner Dam, which is where I'm going now, I believe that Scott has climbed a tree Possibly just for your entertainment, but let's go and find out what he's up to. Well, I certainly hope that Jamie is going to be the one showing you all the buffalo this afternoon. That's one animal that we would prefer to not encounter whilst on foot. They can be quite cantankerous and aggressive. And to be honest, it's the last animal that I would like to bump into. The walking safari. Bulls, though, this just be Another very large animal has been responsible a lot of the leaves on the tree are still green even though it's been pushed over and what I'm going to try and do is show you just try and move a little so bear with these because it's on the other end of the tree that the really interesting evidence that are ordinarily too high up and as soon as we get over here we will see the elephants have come in and trimmed the top of a lot of these you can see many, many members of the herds especially the youngsters would have then been able to access these leaves and again it's a very very dry time of the year it's difficult conditions for all the herbivores and what negative impacts on some of the larger trees at this time of the year as we experience the drought but we can't be hard on the elephants and it's a natural cycle every now and then to have a drought to have a drought. you back to Jamie I definitely don't blame Scott for not wanting to meet the buffalo. I've left them alone for now and I've come upon some rather pregnant impala and I'm sort of just giving them a little bit of space to move out of my way. I feel a bit bad now at this stage. The females are positively bulging. They've got, I don't know, maybe two or three weeks left of their pregnancy and they're looking absolutely enormous. I don't really want to push them into running more than they have to because somehow to me it must be incredibly uncomfortable at this stage. Now I've heard lots of different theories because in the next few weeks when the Impala drop their lambs it's going to be pretty much in the space of about three days and then there's a sort of a late lambing session about two months later for those ewes that didn't fall pregnant for the first mating session. But for the most part, I would say it's probably around 80% of the ewes, maybe even higher, will drop their lambs around almost exactly the same time. And I've heard lots of different theories as to why it is and how it is that they control it. Probably the most convincing is that it's based on the length of the day. So rather than rainfall or anything like that, depending on where they are in the country, their bodies have adapted to responding to that time of day or that length of day that corresponds to the start of the rainy season. Of course, that doesn't always get it right. 
because as with this year, it looks as though it's going to be a little bit late on our side, unfortunately, if it happens at all. But it's interesting to see. There's a lot of people that have heard stories about ewes being able to delay the birth of their lambs by two weeks or so. And I don't know how true that is. I still remain pretty much unconvinced. There's definitely no conscious thought there. And it might have stemmed from the fact that impala ewes in different places give birth at different times. Because that's how their bodies, that's what their bodies have got used to in terms of the rainy season in that area. I'm not sure what you think. Uh, that's just my personal opinion. It seems fairly physically impossible that a ewe is able to delay birth by any physical effort on her own. I've mentioned that those Duggar boys are water dependent and they're on their way to the pumped water hole that is around the Wuertel and Gallego lodges. Donna, you've raised an interesting question. If there are no water holes around, does it mean that the animals will move to places, to different places outside of where we are now to try and get access to water? And the answer is yes, most likely, especially for the water dependent animal. Luckily we do have that pumped water hole to keep them coming and hopefully Bifflesworth will hold water to the end. There's a, there's a bush buck hiding in the, in the branches. I'll try and get you a view. I don't know if oh, he's going to disappear. I'll try and have a look. Oh, I think he's going to... Nope. He has vanished, unfortunately. I always like stopping for bush buck because they are... We don't see them all that often. We see lots of Inyala, but we don't see bushbuck often. But to Donna's question, yes, if they can, they'll start heading to areas where there's more access to water. It puts everything under a lot of pressure. Of course, especially for the hippos, as a water-dependent creature, they definitely have to move. We're lucky we've got the pumped water hole, so they'll be heading backwards and forwards from there. That will be enough to keep most of them around here. And actually, Donna, what is going to have an enormous impact is the quality of the food. For elephants and animals that browse, it's a little bit easier. We've seen how green the leaves have gone. I know that Scott was showing you thatching grass earlier on his walk. There's a lot of different species of grass out here, but the ones that are the most nutritious and the most valuable in terms of being palatable and good for the animal, they prefer areas of good rainfall and good soil content. So the less water we have, the less grazing. The less grazing we have, the less grazing animals. And by extension, the predators have to move as well in order to find viable prey options. Lynn, I'm really sorry. We have a leopard for our viewers. Let's see who this is. I honestly have no idea. Who have we got here? Hey, hey! Our luck has continued. Look at that tail twitching. It spotted something. I say yes, it looks like a he. I can't see who it is at the moment. Okay, let's try and stay with him. No, it's a her, it's a she. Oh, if this is Karula, she's going to make life difficult in this block. Okay, I'm going to keep my eyes on her. visual.
does this look like to us? I need to see her face. I think it's Karula. Hey, how's that for luck? So exciting. She's about to disappear down into the drainage line. We're going to try and stay with her. Lucky charm or something. Hmm? <laughs> so far, Tibbs and I have had the most extraordinary few days. This morning being the slight exception. Sure, you can see how thick it is in here, but I am going to try and stay with her. so you can get a view. I need it to look back so we can confirm if it is our wonderful... Oh, beautiful. This is not Karula. This is a... It looks like a young male. I definitely see parts that Karula does not have. Who is this, guys? Is it quarantine? Is it Kanuma? I don't know. I haven't ever seen either of them. Excited. Oh, it's thick in here. We might have hit a dead end. We might need to go round. That was so amazing to see. Young male. Not a bula, it's not Tumana. Maybe it is the famous Kanuma who I've heard so much about. Well done, Jigga. Oh, ducking in the drainage line. through here. Let's try it and see what we can do. Now, I think because of the noise that I'm making and the fact that I really need to concentrate here. And TV bashing doesn't make for the best viewing. We're going to head back across to Scott for now. And I'll be back with you, hopefully still with our leopard in view. Hello, and welcome back. So happy that Jamie's found you this male leopard. Isn't that exciting stuff? Big surprise, and I hope you continue to get a few more good views of that. But for now, you're back to the bushwalk, and we've stumbled upon an old carcass. It looks like a kudu to me. And it's just quite nice to take a look at carcasses and just see how everything works. When ordinarily, when the animals are alive, you don't get as much as a close view. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come a little bit closer and show you these molars, which are going to be used for chewing on the leaves that kudu eat. And teeth fit quite well together like that, as you can see. And what I'm going to also do is I'm just going to back up a little bit and then get the rest of the skull. So this jaw has fallen off, but we can show you the other side of the skull, the big cavity where the eyeball would sit. And interestingly, as I turn it around, you'll see the cavity where the brain was. And I'm showing you this not to gross you out, but just to show you that nothing gets wasted in nature. Something, probably a hyena, has cracked open the back of the skull to access all this brain matter and fed on it and everything's clean. There's no meat left. It's all merely bone which is very hard to digest but even this will eventually be broken down and recycled back into the environment. So nothing goes to waste out here. And just remember that when 
watching kills, they can be quite emotional and obviously you feel sad for the animal that has lost its life, but out here it's necessary for some animals to lose their lives in order for others to continue prospering. Another interesting part of the anatomy that we found is what looks to me like an elbow joint. And it's actually still working. Incredible. Can you believe that? I'm going to try and change the angles for you guys. Just so that you can see all the different working parts. And what I'm guessing is, is that this is the lower part of the kudu's leg. And underneath here would have been the hoof. And this is kind of the ankle, bo ankle bone or foot bone, you could say. So similar to ours like that, but the kudu stand on their toes, not on their heel. This is essentially their heel. So this would have been up to the knee, jo bo knee joint and then up to the hip. That's all my guesses though. I'm no skeleton but just know that this thing is still working as if the animal is still alive. So incredible that it operates without any bodily fluid. We'll keep searching now for some other interesting stuff to show you. But I am told though that we don't have the best signal here. So we're not going to move too far and what I'm going to keep doing is showing you other parts of the bones. This is the last one to show you. You can see a bit of a ball joint over here. Very circular in shape. You can imagine something round fitting in there. So maybe this is kind of the hip of the kudu. You could use it as a spatula, I guess, if we were living in caveman days and we needed something to flip our ostrich, our fried ostrich eggs. This would be a good spatula to use. And important to remember that many of our ancestors used a lot of bones as tools back in the day. And I guess we are very privileged with all the appliances we have, but nice to remember how our ancestors got us to where we are today. And using bits of bone like this, I'm sure would have been high up on their agenda. I wonder if, oh, it is still here. We're gonna try and show it to you. It's an animal we don't often get to show you and it's a bit of a gamble because it is low down and whenever Jandre bends down it causes trouble with signal but let's just play with it. There's a tiny little grasshopper perched on this little sapling here. Let's see if Jandre can get it for you. Look at that! Awesome and it hasn't jumped! I hope you guys have still got signal in picture because if you do you are going to be having some great views of this little green grasshopper very well camouflaged on this tree it looks like a tiny little acacia of sorts but to be honest i'm not entirely sure look at its antenna sticking up out of its head there absolutely awesome now it could jump with its incredibly powerful legs as well as fly at any moment but it's feeling confident with its camouflage and for now <coughs> excuse me it's allowing us some great views I believe you can see a few small little bumps on its abdomen from your side I'm not too sure what those are all about but a well camouflaged grasshopper there's many different types out here but this one is bright green in coloration and will be enjoying nibbling on, I'm sure, the leaves of this tree that it's sitting on right now. Absolutely awesome! This is what I'm talking about, the finer details, the smaller things that you get to experience whilst on foot, which are almost impossible to share and explore whilst in the vehicle. Yet, if you weren't having the vehicle option, you wouldn't be spending time with that big male leopard as you are. So this goes to show how well the walk and the vehicles complement one another. You see different things from the two different views and I hope you're enjoying your safari this afternoon. I'm certainly loving being on foot again and look forward to carrying on now. We're going to stay as okay. Jandre is doing an incredible job <coughs> making all the movements as good as possible because you can imagine as Jandre bends down 
the antenna on his back bends forward and that doesn't work well for the signal. So every time he bends down, he needs to squat with his back straight, keeping the antenna straight. It's not easy. <coughs> ah, here's a kind of round joint that may have fitted into that hip bone earlier. Now you can see very well how well smooth, well rounded it is. And you could probably imagine that spatula that we looked at earlier fitting onto there well. This is a big femur, probably the main bone in the kudu's leg. Also interesting to see how the bones get scattered around the crime scene. A lot of people would kind of assume that they would all be in one pile together. But when you think about it, hyena, lion and leopard are all powerful carnivores that will tear carcasses to pieces and fight with one another and with other species in order to get as much of that food as possible. Just got my ash bag out to keep testing the wind. It's a very windy afternoon and it's kind of blowing in the same direction that we're moving in. So what we'll read into that is that the animals may smell us before we actually see them, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Now one thing I didn't mention is the potential age of that carcass. So Donna, thanks for asking that question. And it seems to me like it is quite old, probably at least a year. But difficult to say, because the animals out here are so effective in breaking the various kills or carcasses or even dung, it generally happens quite quickly. So it could have been within a year. I don't remember seeing lions or another animal feeding on that kudu. A lot goes without our knowing. So I'm guessing that's what happened. We're quite in the middle of a thick block here, not close to any roads. And I'm guessing the animals that killed that did it undetected. But I'd say at least a year. Hard to be certain though, because like I said, there's so many different animals from the hyena, the bone crushers who will break down the carcass initially, to the vultures who will come and pick the carcass clean with their beaks. And even within the vultures, there's the different levels. There's the white, the lappet faced vulture, who's the biggest and the strongest, who will feed on the majority of the meat. Then the white backed vulture, and then the hood vulture, which has got a tiny thin little beak, which will go through the carcass like a fine tooth comb picking off all the little bits of meat. Then after that, the bugs and the insects and the flies and the other decomposers come in, the maggots will start breaking everything down. So generally, the carcasses are left crystal clean. Earlier on, I was mentioning that buffalo bulls are the last thing you'd want to come across whilst on a walking safari. And now Lynn has just asked, have I ever come across them? And if so, have I had to scramble up a tree? Yes, Lynn, many, many events have occurred whilst on foot where I've had to climb trees, namely for Cape Buffalo, running away from them, the hippopotamus, and the black rhino. Those are the three animals that have got me up trees more than any other. Other animals, it doesn't really make sense to climb trees. For example, lion and leopard would be able to clamber up after you. Elephants, unless you were very quick, as quick as a monkey up a tree, they'll just be able to pluck you out with their trunk or just flatten the whole tree like I was standing on earlier that had been flattened by elephants. So it's advisable to only climb trees for certain species and you can only climb trees if you don't have guests. So all those events have been without guests and just been with my colleagues and occasionally we will kind of not take chances but push the bounds to a small degree and that an experience to how to react to animals that are understanding of what it's like when they do charge. So it's not something you set out to do is to irritate animals but every now and then as a guide I feel that it's good training to push the boundaries when you don't have any responsibilities on your hands. Thanks Lynn though. Hopefully we won't be climbing any trees this afternoon because if we will be 
Jandre is not going to be very popular with me because it's not going to be easy for him to climb up a tree with that backpack. Ah, well, thanks very much to Terry, who's pointed out that the spatula bone that I pointed out that we could have used for flipping some eggs has actually been correctly determined as the scapula, a shoulder bone. So thank you very much, Terry, an expert in the field for confirming that. And this is what I love about Safari Live, the fact that people from around the world can enjoy this experience and share knowledge with everyone. So thanks, Terry, and good to know where all those bones fit in to the anatomy of that kudu. So I'm going to drop to my knees quickly and become an aardvark who is responsible for this mound of earth here. It's not very fresh, but what's happened is this aardvark or an ant bear, kind of a pig-like animal with a long thin snout, incredibly big four quarters and long nails, would have come in, smelt some termites down in this hole, meters below the ground, and then come in with its massive claws and started excavating. Now, I'm not gonna be able to do nearly as good of a job, but it would have had its head in this hole and been excavating out of it like this. And I don't know if it would have got many termites, but that's what I would have been trying to do far more efficiently than I was now. But what is interesting is that you can actually see the tail of the... I'm going to get you back to Jamie as quick as possible. She's got you another glimpse of the leopard, and we'll continue talking about this when you get back. Oh. There was an elephant bottom disappearing. I wanted to just show you him playing in the dam, but I think we're going to leave him for now since he's disappearing into the drainage line, just like our sneaky leopard has done. Now, apparently there's lots of debate between you guys as to who that leopard was. I've seen Kunuma, I lied. Well, I didn't intentionally lie, I forgot. I saw Kunuma once, very, very briefly. Um, I've never seen quarantine. Now apparently quarantine has a landing strip of spots down his, the back of his, uh, the middle of his back. Now I have to be honest, I was concentrating a little bit on negotiating that block. It took me about this length of time to get out of that block. Now you can imagine the difficulty that was involved there. But I have a plan. First, well I've got two plans. One is to pop down where he would enter into the drainage line from a secret spot that I know the entrance to. The second is to follow up on the vulture that is sitting in the tree. Way below the other vehicle. And there's some vultures, or at least there's one vulture sitting in a dead tree and I wonder whether Kunuma doesn't have a kill. Kunuma or Quarantine or whoever we're looking at doesn't have a kill down there. I'm going to try and find my sneaky way in. Quite, quite an impressive shoulder workout negotiating those areas off-road. There's definitely some interesting moments there. And I'm going to just, if you see me leaning over the side, it might be for tracks, it might also be to check my tires. Because if we come out of that without a flat tire, I will be incredibly impressed. Now there's a sneaky entrance somewhere just here and it would kind of put me in line with where the leopard would come out. Let's go and investigate the drainage line together, see if we can get him coming out into the shade. Oh, I'm so excited. It's so nice to see a young male. We keep our fingers crossed that he's got a kill in there somewhere. There's a distinct possibility. Although that being said, now that I think about his stomach, he doesn't look too full. Maybe he's down there hunting. Both are distinct possibilities. Uh, is this my sneaky way in? I said I have a sneaky way in. I don't think this is my sneaky way in. No, this is not my sneaky way in. Let's go further along. My sneaky roots into drainage lines start to look a little bit different. 
if I haven't used them in a while. We're going to do a bit of a trip through the drainage line. Back around the elephant landscaping. Squeezing in again. I think that Tebs had some very interesting moments there. <laughs> Dodging the thorn trees that were coming his way. But it seems as though the majority is shifting. Um, Raisa, Christy, Janet and Shumel, and Didi, you are all suggesting that it is Kunuma that we've seen. That's interesting. I'm really excited because I've never seen Kunuma. So I'm really, really keen to get to see it. I just have to find my way in. It's all so thick. You can hear some Franklin's alarm calling in the drainage line. Maybe that's him. They can move so quickly and so stealthily when they want to. Where has this road gone? Aha! It is in here. Let's go! Let's see where. And this would actually... What I'm going to do is I'm going to pop my nose into the drainage line, which we can all do together for now. And if we don't find anything there, then I'm probably going to have to hop off and go for a bit of a walk along the drainage line. The trick then, of course, is to get the vehicle in as well. Let's see what we can do. But why don't you stay with me for now as we head into the drainage line, now that I've found my road in. It's a bit of a secret way. And those of you who might remember this route from, sure, a couple of months ago, where Steph and I were watching in Kahumas on a buffalo kill and the Birminghams came in and chased them off. That's where we're heading to at the moment. I actually see a couple of vultures on trees, so let's see if we can find out what's happening down there. I've heard so many stories about Mr. Kanuma, who is, of course, the offspring of Karula, and therefore the brother or half-brother of Shadow, who we saw yesterday on the Sunset Safari. Done. The elephants have played a couple of games with this road. It's still here. Apparently, Kunuma is quite the character. I know that he's Brent's favourite leopard due to his tendency to do very strange things like smacking buffalo for no apparent reason and then racing up the tree when they chase him. And climbing thin trees. Uh oh. Our route has been blocked since I was last year by a piece of elephant landscaping. So it may be that I have to go and do a bit of a walk on foot through the drainage line. And I think whilst I do that and whilst I navigate my way in, I know that Scott is still staying at his art fog hole that he's found. Of course, the mysterious animal I've never seen. But I think for now, let's head across to Scott and I will be back with you a little bit later. So, all action this afternoon, and I hope Jamie has some luck finding out exactly where that leopard's gone and what those vultures are up to. Just before you came back to us, Jeanne said, oh, here you go. You just found this little caterpillar on its neck. Thankfully, it doesn't look too hairy, but there are one or two hairs on it, so Jeanne might get a little itch developing. But for now, this very cute little caterpillar seems quite relaxed on my thumb. I'm not too sure exactly which moth or butterfly is responsible for laying the eggs of this and incredible to think that that is what this little bug is going to turn into, a beautiful little flying moth or butterfly. 
I'm going to release it a bit later, but for now I'd like to show you one thing to look out for when you come across an excavation like this made by Aardvark. Because I've got quite a long tail that they used to stabilize themselves with, often in the, tr in the track I've just made this with my fingers, but you'll often see a very long straight tail mark down the center of the track. You could imagine it would have been sitting over here with its tail coming straight out behind it. And if it was a male, you can even actually tell what was going on because you can often see the small kind of depressions at the base of his tail where his scrotum would have been pushing into the sand. So if you look closely at Argbar tracks where they have been digging, you can even tell whether it was a male or female responsible for that. Good stuff. We're going to carry on. I must just release this little caterpillar. I hope it likes feeding on bush willow because that's where we're going to release him. There you go. Toodle do. Have a good day. And I hope that's tasty. Oh, it nearly got flung off, but thankfully it hung on for dear life. And our intentions were good. Execution not ideal, but like I say, it's hung on. And I wonder if it's even going to start feeding on it right this second. Looks like it's thinking about it, to be honest. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we actually saw it start feeding? After being stuck on Jandre's neck for a while, it's probably starving. But... We don't have all day, Mr. Caterpillar, so we're going to leave you to it. And maybe we'll find some more caterpillars having a feast later on. So speculations that the leopard that has been seen is Kunyuma, which is exciting stuff. We haven't seen Kunyuma for a, for a while, and I've just got a radio message, and it's an awesome radio message that I cannot res resist, saying, can we go and help and look for the leopard? We certainly can. So we are going to do a U-turn, head back towards the vehicle, which is parked on the quarantine clearings, and that way we'll be able to get into the area to help Jamie relocate sooner rather than later. So let's go back the way we came and we're going to send you back to Jamie while we rush back to the vehicle. That way we can concentrate on getting there as safely as possible and hopefully we'll have some good news for you once we get onto the trail of that leopard. Wonderful, so we've got back up on its way and whilst Scott, sit, Scott makes his way in, I'm going to try another area. Now many of you may have been watching when James and I think it was Brian on camera with him had Kanuma in the drainage line to the east of the dam and there's a nice path that has made its way in there and my idea is to head across into there since I can't get down into the Milwaukee from this side. Let me see if I can make my way into the Milwaukee from that side. And then I will chat to Scott as well on the Game Drive channel and coordinate our search efforts. I'm really, really excited to get to see this leopard. Uh, bear with me one moment. I'm just listening to the Game Drive channel. to have a moment to jump on and ask for clarification. Oh, okay. It's not, it's not our sighting. I saw Taxon head that way and I thought maybe we'd got lucky and that Kunuma had come back out onto the road, but that's not the case. He is on Buffles Hook, so the property to the north of our boundary. back around over the dam wall for probably what's this, the third time, fourth time this afternoon. Keep your eyes peeled because this is the part of the drainage line that he loves. And we're looking for that tiny flick of the white at the end of his tail. 
and the black on the tips of his ears. And for those of you who are watching both the live drives and the Juma Dam camera, keep your eyes on the Juma Dam as well, because he might come across for a drink. If we don't find him now, he might be heading there slowly towards sunset. And I know... Well, we head across and try, try, try and find, try and relocate Kanuma. Phyllis, you were wanting an update on Shadow. Phyllis, I'm not sure if you were watching yesterday, but we had, Tebs and I had Shadow in the morning and the afternoon on the Sunset Safari. Looking very full and very sleepy, and very contented she was just on Zebra Drive in Arethusa. I lost her in the morning and then Tebs actually found her in the afternoon and we spent quite a bit of quality time with her just sleeping and I found out afterwards once we left that she did in fact have half a Steenbok with her as well. So she was very well fed, very contented. I haven't heard any updates from today but Phyllis, you'll be happy to know that Shadow, the half-sister of Kunuma, is safe and sound. Okay, let's find another one of my sneaky routes into drainage lines. Take two. Hopefully the elephants haven't blocked this one as well. Luckily we've got Kevs on the back and he's become something of a good luck charm and definitely got a very good set of eyes in his head. Alright, now leopards are sneaky creatures. They don't always pop out where you expect them to, so we start looking really carefully as we squeeze through the buffalo doors. Okay, good view of Kunuma is worth a little bit of scratches, a bit of blood, sweat, maybe not tears, but a bit of blood and sweat for sure. Hello, Yola. question from Shamrock. I'm going to be with Shamrock's question in a moment. Hold on. I've got a passenger on my leg. I'm going to just remove said passenger from my leg and we're going to have a look at it while we listen for alarm calls in the drainage line. Bear with me one moment. Stuck here. Now, Kunuma should be coming out somewhere in that direction. Let me try and rescue this little, this little fella. Hello. Whoopsie. It's alright. You can't spend the afternoon on my leg, I'm afraid. A little praying mantis, but a beautiful one. So perfectly camouflaged in the bark, to look like bark. You can see its legs curled up in that typical, oops, sorry, manted way. Eyes on the side of its head. And this camouflage that would definitely put it perfectly hidden on a piece of bark, say in a tree that we might have gone driving past. Yeah, it's all quiet on this side. All right, Mr. Mantis, or Mrs. Mantis, most likely, find you a home. Oh, okay, decided to find its own home. It's okay because there's so many, so many branches now on the bonnet that it will be perfectly suited for it. Okay. So, as quietly as possible, which I suppose isn't very quietly, but let's go find the sneaky leopard in a drainage line. And this is a beautiful drainage line. Right, so I've touched on the dry season and even driving through this drainage line it is incredibly dry looking. 
Okay, let's go that way into the drainage line. The elephants will be doing some more engineering. Even down here it is very dry and Shamrock, you are asking how long it takes an ecosystem like this one to normalize after an extreme season. So after, for example, a big drought like we're having at the moment. And the answer is it normalizes. Whoop. It actually normalizes fairly quickly, depending on when the rainfall comes. It will probably take maybe a year or two. There's certain species of grass that are perfectly adapted for dealing with it. So they have nice long strands underneath the ground of root systems known as rhizomes. And those will, if the plant itself at the top starts to die, will go into almost like a form of hibernation during that period. And it takes a while for that to normalize. Alrighty, let's get hold of Scott, get him to come and help us. We need to just tell him where exactly we were. Scott the baby. Yeah, Scott, I think um, the best approach is probably to start moving along the drainage line to the south just at that concrete spot on Central. Uh, last I saw him he was on Vulture's Nest but heading towards the drainage line. Just getting hold, telling him where to go. Alright, Scott's going to head in from that side. I'm going to do a loop back around since we find ourselves a bit stuck once again. On a minute. It sounds like they found him already. That is very exciting news. Let's go. <laughs> We're sorted. I got that. Thanks, Scott. I didn't hear that message come through. Uh, Tex, can I come and join you? I'll take standby. I didn't hear your message come through, but thank you. Okay, so we've got a position to join in the queue, as it happens, unfortunately. Uh, oh, we have to duck. Now, I am very impressed with Mr. Kunuba because he's pulled a trick on us that both Karula and Shadow have done to me in the last few days, which is go in one direction and then completely change his mind and go in the other. But at least they've managed to find him so we can go and join him in a moment. Let's go see. We'll probably bump into Scott soon. See what he's up to. Oh well. This is good news. Let's go and find out if it really oh, if it really is Kanuma after all that. After all that searching. Updates on the Game Drive channel. You see, it's 
seems to be some disagreement as to which leopard it is that they've just found sleeping on the road. They seem to think it's Karula. So that means Karula met up with one of her sons, if it is Karula, because that leopard that we saw definitely was not a female. They were definitely testicles. I wonder what's been happening here. Maybe they both have a kill. Maybe they've been sharing one. It's not impossible for her to be sharing a kill with her adult son. Our stations, just to confirm, have I got standby one on that ingwe on Vulture's Nest? Sorry, just making sure I have a place in the queue. very recently. What do you guys think this is? Let's have a look at this tree with the beautiful red flowers. Might have been touched on before. I did not know this species existed before I started working here. We usually see it as an enormous tree on termite mounds. In this case, it's something else, but it has exactly the same bright red flowers with very small petals on them, hence the family name or the name of one of the species in the family known as Brachypetala. Reduced leaves and reduced petals. And this is a dwarf, a dwarf bourbine. So the smaller version of that incredible weeping bourbine that we see and talk about quite frequently. His Latin name is Scotia, Bra Scotia Capitata. And see, this is the only place I've ever seen them in. And similar to the bourbine, it is part of that family and it can be used the bark can be used to treat hangovers, if you so wish. It's named after a great, Aus I think it is Austrian. The Scotia part of it is named after a great Austrian gardener. I just want to find out what's happening. It sounds as though Gorilla might be moving into the Mulwati. Luckily, Scott is keeping an eye on her for us. Interesting question from Maribus, and we're going to be listening for the monkey is calling while we look for these two leopards that are wandering around in this area. And Maribus, you were asking why we never see monkeys on drive, and we generally do, although they are a little bit shy every now and again. But we do see them, and they're a really, really useful way of following up on leopards. They've got such smart, such good eyesight that they are quite a good early warning system. fluttering around. Now, I may 
mentioned earlier that the Impala are going to be giving birth. And I know that Ginny, you're really excited to see that happen. And Lynn, you're wondering when the wildebeest are going to start calving. And the answer is about a month after the Impala, maybe a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks. They carve around December. So we'll be seeing that happening soon as well. And that is an exciting time. There's so much action that happens in the bush around there. And there's nothing better than seeing those little spindly creatures wandering around on wobbly legs. Bear with me one moment. I just want to hop onto the Game Right channel to communicate with Scott. Scott, Scott. Yeah, Scott, that Ingrid I saw was definitely a younger daughter. Neither can you mark quarantine. So I wonder whether she's not heading in to join him. Copy, thanks, Scott. Um, I'll keep you updated. Uh, stations, I just let me know where Karuna's moving or if the space opens up in that sighting. Please. Head along Yala Road South. I think Karula and Kunuma have met up. I really hope that we can get a view of both Karula and Kunuma together, if it is Kunuma. But of course it would be fantastic if Mbula came back and showed up, and then we would have a proper, true leopard family reunion. And three adult leopards would be the most I've ever seen in a sighting before. Um, I would be very excited to see something like that. Raisa was the Scotia, well we pronounce it Scotia capitata, the dwarf ruby. And as I said, the first time I even knew that this species existed out here. It's fascinating to me to learn all about it. It's going to shift out of the way, the elevator for. Vehicles with it, English no, two, two, two now. Yeah. Okay, shop. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Thanks. Me too. Bye. Right. I'm going to make my way in, but there's a lot of confusing directions happening through the Game Drive channel. So whilst I make my way into the sighting, let's head across to Scott. I'll be back with you, fingers crossed, with Karula and maybe even Kuyuma. Well, we were going to go across to Scott, but unfortunately Scott has vanished on us. So we shall all make our way into the leopard sighting together. And try and see if we can get in there and figure out exactly where she is. Zip around the, car, the corner of Nyala Road South. Definitely one of my favourite roads and definitely one of Karula's favourite roads. She loves this drainage area system. 
and I don't blame her. There's plenty of cover, there's plenty of big trees and shade, and a great place to ambush unsuspecting animals. Cross in front of the vehicle. Hello, girl. Sure, we just got here in time. Now that's definitely Karula, but the leopard I saw earlier was not Karula, for certain. I wonder, she must have been having a bit of a meet up with her son. Way bird has just picked up on her presence. She stalks silently into the block. Now, as she disappears into this block, bear in mind it is incredibly thick in there. We might lose her, but at least we got to see her. That's two leopards in one drive. follow her very easily. Which way is she going to do go? She's a sneaky cat, Karula. Whoops. 
try and stick with her as long as possible. Oh, what an often. More off-roading. Two incredible cats. Some serious luck, I think, possibly coming from Ted. Hello, Ted. Crossing in front of me. going to move in front. Here she's going to come through here. Here she comes. Hello beautiful. Stunning in this afternoon light. Okay, try and keep your eyes on her. It's going to be a tricky one. around. I know that Scott is standing by for us. You're okay there, Tim. Don't grab it. Thorny. Standing by on Ingwe Alley. Oh, I hope this is dry. Yep. Yeah. All right, I'm going to try and keep up with her. I'm going to try and find her again. While I do that, Scott's got some Ellie's to show you. Let's head across to him for now. I'll be back with you when I've found Karula. Welcome back everyone. Jandre's just got himself a little bit tangled in an overhanging branch. That's why I needed to reverse there. And there's a herd of elephants up ahead of us. The wind is in our favor, blowing very gently towards you. And we just need to be careful. There seem to be quite a lot of them around here. And what we want to do is make sure that we don't startle on any of them. But with the wind being in our favor, we're going to make the most of this opportunity. What I want to do is just try and find an area where we can kind of bunker down and get a good view of them without having to get too close. They seem quite spread out. And what I'm thinking of doing is maybe actually going around this way. Come on, follow me. Elephants can be exceptionally dangerous animals. And it's important to always be on the side of caution when viewing them. Especially when it's elephant cows and their calves. And... I think this is going to be a good spot for us just to maybe creep up ahead there. You can see one individual. There's another one on its way to join it. And we should be seeing quite a few more as the afternoon progresses. Absolutely wonderful. Being on foot with these giants really does get my heart racing. Making sure that I'm looking around 360 degrees to make sure no other members of the herd are elsewhere there's another big cow that's going to be coming into your view shortly i'm guessing and they in the perfect afternoon sunlight absolutely wonderful stuff the wind is still in our favor interestingly i can see another one now that's feeding just up to our left at about our 10 o'clock and it's kind of coming straight towards us. jean -Ray might be able to get you a quick... Because we can't stay here. They feel threatened. I don't have... 
in front of us. Oh no, well, terrible to hear that. The signal's not much good yet, so we're going to send you back to Jamie. Ah. She's just behind us in the drainage line. Unfortunately, on my side. So Scott's on that side. I'm going to go around the other side and let's see if we can find her on the other side of the drainage line. She might even come out on... Release my hair, please. Thank you. She might even come out on filament's dip and come to the Whoops, a daisy. Oh. Oh. Nothing more exhilarating than... A leopard sighting that you have to work for. Okay. Once the guys have stopped chatting on the Game Drive channel, then I'm going to get a hold of Scott and coordinate our search a little bit better. This drainage line runs all the way from here up and across to Filaman's Dip. So all along that western part where we had the elephants this morning. And it's one of her favorite spots, and it's a great spot if you're a leopard to disappear. Luckily, it's also a spot filled with go away birds and squirrels. And they're going to be our helpers, along with, hopefully, so we can so show them to Mara Ann, I think it was, who asked about monkeys. Hopefully, there's some monkeys as well to give her away. Ah, it was Marabeth. That was it, it was Marabeth. Ah, yeah, and Scott is on the drain. Game Drive channel. Go, Scott. Well, Scott, she's moving along the drainage line to the west. You know that one between Ingwe Alley and Tangle and Trap? Um, if you're on Ingwe Alley, maybe just check for alarm calls and stick your nose into the drainage line if you hear them. I'm going to try some tangle and trap side. Thanks, Scotty. Yeah, she was just ahead of us. And I could hear a go away bird calling. So I'm going to move up to that corner and then we're going to stop and listen. Rinse and repeat. Until we find her. And if we can't find her here, then we're going to go and check for Kanuma because I promise you that was not a female leopard we saw earlier. I know it was not Kula. I know that what she's doing at the moment... Hello. Little dwarf mongoose watching me. I know that... Donna and Paul and many others have picked up on the fact that she was looking a little bit thin and quite possibly in need of a meal. And that could well be what she's up to. She's probably hunting in this drainage line. I think the second time I ever saw Karula, she was hunting along here. It's a perfect spot to ambush things like Steenbok and Daker. And the second time I ever saw her, she ate an entire Steenbok. I mean the entire Steenbok. Hooves bones, everything. All that was left were two bits of jawbone. And she was looking thin like she is now and she devoured it in about 20 minutes. Listening very carefully. And just doing a quick tire check at the same time, but we're looking good. One thing about Karula, she can be very, very sneaky when she wants to be, as we all know. Aha, not sneaky enough for the go-away birds though. They're calling for her, calling at her. Let's go check it out. Drainage line runs all along here. Unfortunately, the inevitable fact of a drainage line which is where water collects, is of course you get the thickest vegetation. Luckily the road cuts through right where she should pop out. I think 
let's go and check up on her there. Where that go away bird is called her. on the back with us because if anyone's going to spot her he is going to Scott and I are moving parallel to each other while we do that let's see things from Scott's perspective on his side of the drainage line Of the away birds alarm calling. I think you're on the other side. Um, and I'm just going to creep into this area. The go away birds could well be alarm calling for Karula, but there's no guarantees that she is. Also, because it's the same area that these elephants are in. One of the most dangerous things you can do when tracking animals is become fixated on the species you are looking for and therefore lose track of other species that may also be moving in the area that could be equally, or in this case, more dangerous than the leopard. Just heard a few more branches breaking up ahead. As I said that, the elephants are nearby. So we need to be on high alert. But don't worry. I'm feeling very comfortable and confident. We must just move slowly. And with a little bit of luck, we're going to bump into Karula. Failing that, we may get you some more views of the elephants. The wind is still in our favor, as you can see, blowing in a westerly direction. Most time I've actually been Karula on foot, she's been quite relaxed with our presence, but will always kind of give way to us. It's very seldom that leopard will stand their ground or confront you when on foot. They typically prefer to avoid us, and that way they would usually move off and not cause any trouble as we find them on foot. Although the last time I found her on foot, it was in this riverbed where Jamie last saw her. And we actually saw her, well, I didn't see the actual takedown, but she made a kill while I was on the radio, Jamie calling her into sighting with the vehicle. Who knows, maybe that will happen again. Little micas that we're using, there's just a tiny little one in between my buttons on my chest here. So that's the only mic we're using for now. We're going to send you back to Jamie. make so much noise that I probably won't hear anything coming. I think she's going to pop out somewhere here. Oh, to know what went on in the minds of those leopards earlier. I wonder what went, what kind of interaction there was between Kunuma and Karula. Ginny has asked me about. Ginny wants to know if I've ever seen a leopard kill from stalk to kill, from start of stalk to kill. The answer is not really unless you count the odd Franklin and the odd mongoose that I've seen them catch. Sorry, there's something in my eye. 
it's okay. My right eye still works. Fine. Um, Ginny, I haven't seen any major kills and stalks from leopards. I've seen cheetah and lion and hyena, but I have oh, sticking of potential meal. Watch out, little Steinbock. Ah, she read my mind. She's dashing off into the bushes. What have you seen, Ted? I keep coming. Whatever it was, Ted saw has disappeared. Oh. Now it wouldn't surprise me at all if Karula popped out here just because she's sneaky like that. She picks a direction and then goes the opposite way. Now one thing, just to carry on with Ginny's question, the one thing about hunts and watching them from start to finish and that I've, most of my time spent in the bush has been in areas like this, so really thick, dense vegetation. And to sit and watch a kill from start to finish and actually see the whole thing unfold. I've arrived just afterwards, I've seen the stalk and then missed the kill or seen the kill but missed the stalk because it's so thick that I never want to disturb or disrupt the kill in any way or have any kind of negative impact on it. I'm always really hyper aware of that. And I think that's why I've probably never seen a kill from start to finish. You've always got to be so cautious that you don't, in your own interest, Sorry, there's a bird to show you. And I think it's the greatest spot of cuckoo I've been trying to show you. Yes, it is. Awesome. Please stay, please stay. No, 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 don't go, don't go, don't go, don't go. Please don't go, please don't go, please don't go. Sitting on the marula tree there. Oh, going to disappear. Okay, it's still close to us. I haven't forgotten about Karula, guys, but I can't go bashing through the bushes after her. Not if there's three vehicles as well. And this is a bird species that I've hardly ever seen in my life, which is why I've got so excited about it. It's called the Greatest Spotted Cuckoo. And it's playing hard to get. There's a pair of them. I guess they live here. It's the second time I've seen them here. Just bear with me one moment. It's a really beautiful bird. And I can still see it. A pair of them are hopping around this termite mound. Here we go. Hey, well done, Tibbs. Cuckoo species I've hardly ever seen. Greater spotted cuckoo. And they're so pretty. When I say I've hardly ever seen them, this is, I don't know, the third time in my life. And it's not because they're rare, it's just because of the areas that I've worked in. This is the first time I've seen them living around here. I know Scott mentioned them earlier this, for the sunrise safari, if you were watching. Hello boys and girls. It's actually a species I know so little about because I've never seen them before. Hey, hopping out. I'm not even sure which species they parasitize. Because of course cuckoos are species specific. And by parasitize I mean obviously they lay their next nest eggs in a nest that isn't theirs. They're beautiful. I'm so glad. It seems like this is where they're living at the moment. You can 
see that slightly yellow throat, distinctive, and then the spotting on the back and the grey head. As far as I know, there's no difference between the male and the female, apart from a slight size difference. I'm actually going to double check that though, whilst we watch them. Well done Ted, thank you. And then just double check that there isn't a dimorphism. Look at how beautiful they are. Hopping around. Now cuckoos specialize in catching hairy caterpillars. But that doesn't mean that they're not going to be after other insects around here. No, there's no difference between the sexes. So this could be either the male or the female. Ooh, look at that. Somebody got fed. I wonder then if that's not the female on the left being courted by the male on the right since she's the one who took the food. Beautiful. So to add to your bird list, I'm pretty sure this is one you guys haven't got on that whole bird list that we keep throughout the safari live drives. He's twisting and turning. Always on the lookout for that sharp beady eye for a grasshopper or a mantid. Big birds, very big solid birds. That's how hard those parents will end up having to work to raise a chick to this size. There's, no, there's not really another cuckoo that you can confuse this one with. Bounce, bounce, bounce. <laughs> and then running along. That is a migrant. So it's also come in along with the Jacobins and the Deirdricks. Sure. Okay. Wonderful. Definitely an exciting moment for me. Thank you, Tibbs, for catching our cuckoo species. Oh, I'm so excited. We might get to see them every day if they hang around here. One of those things that there's so many, so many exciting new things to see out here, even for me. All right, let's continue on our leopard search. I mean, we've had two in one drive. Let's see if we can actually get more than a, a flash of spots for you all. Give my clutch leg a little bit of a shake. <laughs> nice reminder from both Tada and Paul. Now they're saying it's Saturday, so Kunuma is probably popping back to mom for a bit of home cooking, as it were. Maybe a free meal or so, or, or two. I like that. It's also useful to know the days of the week, thank you, because I'm generally quite bad at them. I spent the last hour thinking it was Friday, so there you go, I stand corrected. Let's do one more loop. The other vehicles have left the area now, they know Perula and they know that that drainage line is unbelievably thick, but we're going to do one more loop, see if she pops out, see if we get some alarm calls, and if we don't then I'm going to shoot back across to where we were looking for Kanuma. that that great spotted cuckoo 
was a new bird for Sada and I'm assuming most of the other viewers, I don't know, I'm sure the long, long term viewers would have seen them before, but it's a bird to add to my bird list as well since I've started working at Juba. I'm glad that you enjoyed it. They're beautiful birds. friend of mine who is watching from Switzerland. Steph and I were guides together about, oh my word, it was about a year ago now, it was more than a year ago, Steph, when we met. And Steph tells me that her book tells her that the brood hosts for greater spotted cuckoos are crows and starlings. Thanks, Steph. You're the best. I'm pretty sure I remember which book it is that you're using as well. I'm fairly certain I know. Steph and I went to the same went through the same guide training just about a year apart. And Steph is an interesting aside. I think he was the first person the, well, one of the first things my puppy did when she met Steph at about six weeks old, she was this big. Um, first thing she did was throw up on poor Steph. So I'm sure she has fond memories of us. Okie dokie. wondering if Scott is still in the area looking for Karula or tracking for tracking Karula. The answer is yes he is. He's just towards Ingwe Alley. He's searching around there as far as I know. Um, he's not tracking per se because he's got to find tracks first but he is around there. I'm sure you should hear from him soon. It's a difficult area and it is very, very thick. But if anybody can locate Scott, if anybody can locate Karula, it is Mr. Scott Dyson. I know that he's found her in that drainage line before because he's pulled me into her before. And her, there's a very familiar looking Mahindra ahead of us as well. I think it's safe to assume that Scott is wandering about somewhere there. There is Scott's abandoned vehicle. Come on, Mahindra. Oh, there's an elephant. Sure. Hello, elephant. I don't suppose you've seen a leopard anywhere. I just saw a big grey bottom disappearing into the trees. Oh, there's a couple of elephants. These must be the elephant Scott was with earlier. big herd from earlier this morning. We had that amazing charge from the one little one. Ah, uh, it looks like, oh my word, it was everywhere. Here he comes. Here he comes. He's coming for us again. Hello, Bubba. He's coming to be naughty. Thinking about it, but you're not so brave because mommy's not close, is she? I was about to say that we were charged this morning by a naughty little boy and I think this is him. <laughs> a bit un bit indecisive because mommy is not quite there. So he's going to give a couple of head shakes and then pretend to eat. definitely the same herd from earlier. He's instantly recognizable by pure attitude. The one amazing thing that we experienced this morning is that 
when he charged, and he charged quite, I wouldn't say seriously, but he certainly came really close. He came within about 30 centimeters of the car, or half a meter of the car. And when he did it, his mom came up at the last moment when he squealed. And instead of coming to discipline us, she quite deliberately came across to tell her baby off for causing trouble with us. I know that sounds crazy, but you could just see it in the way that she behaved. She looked at me as if to assess whether or not I was the problem, but she'd been watching the whole time and she knew that her baby had provoked it. And then I also might have, I might have ratted him out as well. I did tell her that he was causing trouble, but he's very cute. Okay, I'm gonna scoot forward. There's the young baby as well, the young female calf that we've seen before. By the way, for those of you who weren't with us on this morning's sunrise safari, this is the herd with the backwards tusk facing, backwards face, why can't I get that right? Backwards facing tusk female, not backwards tusk female facing or something. Oh, hello boy. Going to come and do it again, are you? There you go. Yes, look at that attitude. Hello. Hello, little one. I think you're gorgeous, even if you do want to chase me. You're a little bit too small to come chase me. Yes, go follow, Mom. <laughs> Indecision there. Backwards and forwards swinging of the foot. Little mischief. Mom is completely unconcerned by the antics of her son, except when he gets himself into trouble. He's now digging under the leaf litter for no discernible reason. Well, we might have smelled something. I'm actually going to shuffle backwards because I don't want to push them out of the way. Let me just move backwards and... Oh no, I can move forwards now. I don't... Obviously, as, as cute as it is when he does come forward and do that, I don't want to provoke it deliberately. If he chooses to come up to me, that's fine, but I don't want to deliberately push him. That's obviously teaching him very bad manners and very bad habits. Now, what I'm, depending on what mom does now, I'm probably going to stay here. Okay, she's going to cross the road. Baby's going to poke his head out. A little one. Hmm. I thought it was a little boy, but that's a little girl. It makes it even more unusual behavior. Usually it's the little boys that do that. Unless there's two of them in this herd, which is entirely possible. It's a huge herd. Okay, we can shuffle forward a bit now. Obviously, I can't go racing round the block to find Karula if there's a herd of elephants in the way. So I'm not going to. It's just going to upset them. Hello, girl. Sorry, 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 sorry. It's all right, it's all right. It's okay. Okay. Shame, you don't have to be scared. <laughs> that is one very frustrated Eddie walk. <laughs> Could not have been clearer how unimpressed she was with us at that point. Sorry girl, I didn't mean to upset you. That head shake from side to side. That was the typical teenage girl moody walk. There we go. <laughs> One final statement. That last bit was the equivalent of a teenager slamming their bedroom door as they walk out as she walked out. Here's our backwards tusk. No, backwards facing task. What is wrong with me? 
My ability to speak has gone seriously downhill. I'm not sure. Must be the heat. Backwards facing task. Say it five times fast, I might get it right. Oh, very strong, innocent smell in this drainage line. Hello, big girl. Here's our task friend. I'm not even going to try and say it again. Oh, we're going to rock a bit. She's just off to our left. It's not the clearest view, but she is here with that amazing deformed tusk. I was asked a question this morning as to whether I've ever seen an animal with a deformity like this female has, whether I've ever seen one that ultimately works to the animal's advantage. And I could not think of one example, except maybe that this female can use that tusk more effectively for digging. Um, Tebs, I'm just going to roll forward ever so slightly so you can get a better view. As far as it goes, without upsetting her. Hey, big girl. Now we know from experience that she's definitely one of the highest ranking females in this herd. And that tusk is incredible. I'm so surprised it hasn't broken off, although it looks like it's about to at the tip. She's not the only one that we see with this tusk, but she does have the clearest groove along that. She's very easily identifiable. Hello, oh, big girl. Oops, sorry, big boy. Please don't take offense to that. No, it is a big girl. We're okay. Strength involved. We should ask them to clear a space for us to the leopard, where the leopard may be hiding. Easier than doing it with poor old Jigger. Here we go. A minor piece of gardening. I wonder why she did that. I think she's off to the nice, fresh, green, sheltered shoots of grass that are down there at the base. I know that Scott is going to be running out of light fairly soon and he's just sitting watching the sun go down. Let's head across to him briefly and we'll be back again with our Ellie's very shortly. Well, no luck in our search for Karula, but it's been wonderful exploring this area and I've just decided to climb up onto this termite mound to get a view of the setting sun. It's incredible that only tiny little insects build these structures that are absolutely rock solid and if my balance was better I would attempt to stand on this small chimney that I've just sat on. Ah, What an absolutely incredible view. Come and take a closer look. It's quite magical a lot of clouds out to the west, oranges, purples, blues and whites. And aren't we so lucky to be enjoying the beauty of the South African low fault this evening. Interesting that that herd of elephants has started enjoying a feast next to our vehicle. It's going to make our lives a little bit interesting in the next 10 or 15 minutes when we need to get back there but that's all part of the adventure. One special story I do remember from early on in my guiding career, we parked our car under a lone marula tree in the, middle in the middle of a big open clearing. And we did about a two hour walk and on returning to the vehicle, we were about 200 meters away and I noticed a strange shape dangling down from a marula tree branch. And upon inspection with my binoculars, it was a female leopard sleeping in the tree above our car but she thankfully took one look at us approaching and decided it would better be it would be a better option to go off and find another marula tree elsewhere we're gonna continue off in the direction of the vehicle 
and see what else we can find while I try and dismount from this mound without falling down. This is probably going to be an easy pathway to move off through down here. Well, interesting stuff happened this afternoon. Jamie's convinced that it was a young male leopard you guys saw initially, and then Karula popped onto the scene. So, certainly not an unlikely event for both her mother and her old cub, if it was in fact Kunuma, to be lurking in the same area. And let's hope that we manage to maybe hear some more alarm calls in the next few minutes that may guide us closer to where she could be. Now, happy to hear that one of my good friends, young Matty, is watching the show. Hello Matty, good to know you on the walk with us. And Matty's interested to know if I found any lion bones. Earlier on we found bones of what I thought was a kudu. And Matty's interested to know if I've found any carcasses of lion. And yes, I have been lucky enough to find the skull of a lion, Matty. But it doesn't happen as often as you would think or as we would like. But what I can assure you is that a lot of the animals out here will eventually pass away and their bones are left lying around somewhere. It's just a matter of finding them. Maybe on one of our walks we'll find something like a warthog tusk or a hippo skull. And he'd also like to know what's the most interesting carcass or bone I've ever seen. And Matty, probably that of an elephant's. The bone of an elephant's leg, so the main leg bone called the femur, which in our case is only about 40 centimeters long, for an elephant's it's about this big. Can you believe it? So it's the biggest bone you would ever imagine. It's about this round and almost as tall as me. So that was interesting to see. And we also also see a lot of small animals' bones and carcasses like little mice and lizards. So it's really interesting to explore the skeletons of the animals. We need to keep moving. Otherwise, we may end up bony skeletons in the bush as well which we don't want. It's beginning to get a little bit dark and I must remind you and assure you we are not nervous or cautious or scared but we are cautious and it's always important to be cautious and respect the fact that there are some dangerous animals out here and we're going to just focus on getting to the vehicle safely and we're going to send you back to Jamie who's still with those elephants. back and here's a little elephant who was slightly disgruntled with our arrival while Scott rushes back to the car. Oh, somebody's cross at the back there. Just while Scott's making his way back as it gets dark, this elephant's cute. He's got one tusk and the other one hasn't erupted yet. Almost like a child with when they lose their teeth and they've sort of got one tooth coming through and I need him to turn so I could show you. But just bear with me one moment. I want to contact Scott and let him know that there's an entire elephant herd around here. Scott, Scott. Yeah, Scott, I'm assuming you heard about the end law in the drainage line. turn around so we get a really nice view of these ellies one last time as the sun starts to go down and while I do that I know that Scott was chatting to Matthew who is nine years old. Matthew you wanted to know if Scott's ever found lion bones and some of the cool bones that he might have found in his time and Matthew I've also found some really amazing bones. The one my friend and I went through a stage where we actually collected them. We went, we went through the bush and we collected the skulls and other parts of dead animals. And we, by the end of it, had quite the collection. And I know Steph in Switzerland is watching and she'll remember some of the smellier times that we had with our skull collecting phase. 
where we had to boil them down. With Matthew, we had lion, we had giraffe, zebra, wildebeest. I even had a lion's foot at one point that I was trying to put together. And they have these amazing bones that stretch down and really, really complex feet. Incredible to see. But definitely something fascinating to collect. around gently forward to find our elephant friend with her curious tusk. Okay, okay, okay. I hear you, I hear you. Little boy. <laughs> Did you hear that little brrrr? That was entirely directed at me. He decided he's had enough of our comings and goings. And would we please stop it? Now I was trying to find our backward facing tusk friend, but I don't think we're going to be getting past this particular little elephant without being shouted at and reprimanded once again. <laughs> I feel that message is well received. Shamrock, you wanted to know if that backwards facing tusk could be considered to be ingrown. It's a distinct possibility as to how that came about in a way that maybe that elephant had a bit of a swelling around the tusk growth site. Something must have caused it to grow in the wrong direction. I guess you could call it ingrown, but I'm not sure how that came about. Bear with me one moment because if I don't drink some water, I'm going to lose my voice. I'll just hold on one moment. <laughs> I'm currently carrying what looks like an excessive amount of water. It's a five litre plastic water bottle. But so far it's served me very well. Yes. Let me tell you something, but um, I don't know, I suppose a 40 degree day, that much water is fairly useful. Might look a bit excessive though. Hello little boy, you're coming through. Come on, let's see you say hi. As I said, that backward facing tusk has probably come through from an error that happened while it was growing at the very beginning of that elephant's childhood, as it were, um, calfhood, if we want to call it that. We have an interesting question that's come through about what age it is that elephants first start growing their tusks. And that's an interesting one because they have milk tusks first just like children have milk teeth and then ah oh, here's our friend hello big girl she's gonna walk through in front of us sorry sorry tebs she's just coming through ah she's gonna disappear okay we'll let her walk around to the side of us all our little ellies are moving out of view so barbara in answer to your question as to age Babies grow milk tusks when they're a couple of months old. There we go. And then at about three years old, they start to grow their permanent tusks. So their permanent tusks start to poke through. Now this little one is probably about three and a half, four. Getting big tusks now. This is the cheeky little elephant who gave me a talking to. Hey little girl. across and we've got quite a few members of the herd slowly making their way up on my right I love this particular elephant herd they are huge in number and really nice and relaxed hello big big boy a girl can't tell now this is one of the, probably one of the high ranking females, but that female with the curved tusk is definitely one of the top of the herd structure members, possibly even the matriarch. And Judith, you were wondering 
how it is that a matriarch is determined. Is it always the biggest, oldest female? And Judith, yes, for the most part it is. She's usually the oldest female with the most experience. But then what might happen as she starts to reach right at the end of her life is the second female in command that might be a younger sister or a younger cousin or possibly even her oldest daughter will take over from her. But it's usually one of the biggest and oldest elephants in the herd. And it's sometimes quite difficult to tell because although the matriarch is... Listen, boy. Sorry, he's right behind us. Not, not close, but he is coming to shake his head at us, and I just want to keep an eye on him. I'll keep talking at the same time, but just don't mind me if I'm not always looking at you. So, Judith, it's, it's difficult to tell, because although she's the top of the herd, she'll have one or two females, usually her sisters or cousins, who will be quite high-ranking with her and support her in the decisions. So sometimes she might lead and they walk at the back. Sometimes they might lead and she will walk at the back. It's not always the case that they do exactly the same job all the time. Sorry, I'll be with you now. I'm just watching him. He's young. He's, no, he's of absolutely no threat to us, but he just wants to be naughty. And I think he's been plotting this for quite a while. He's got plenty of space to... Oh, who was asking about Birchall's Kukul's? I've just heard Birchall's Kukul's call. Somebody asked me this morning, it might have been Dave. Um, or it could have been Donna. Some, one of the viewers asked me this morning about whether, why they never see Birchall's Kukul's anymore. There's a bubba, there's a bubba, there's a bubba. Running across. Little one. Ah, oh, it was Marco. Marco, I don't know if you're watching or not, but I've just heard the Birchall's Kukul's calling. The Rainbird, one of their other names, often calling when there is rain on the way. So fingers crossed, that's why they're calling now. I shift forward ever so slightly. It's getting a bit dark for our elephant sighting. We're going to have to leave soon. Scott's been trying to get hold of me on the Game Drive channel, so I'm going to reply to him now. our mail again gave us some hassles this morning in a slide forward ever so slightly I'm feeling we're about to get him swinging his head around hello boy how are you doing on this beautiful evening in the sunset yes you're spectacular yes gorgeous boy and hello, little one. Have you come to say hello as well? That's very close to my car. Please don't touch my car. That's rude. That's rude. Yes, I thought so. It's a bit of bravado. Oh, this herd is so full of characters. The teenage boy pushing boundaries, trying to see exactly how far he can throw his weight around. Unfortunately, in this case, the answer with me is not very far. There's a male there behind him that he definitely shouldn't pick a fight with. Hello, mister. Nice big bull that's been accompanying the herd all day in the African sunset. Let's just watch them feeding peacefully and listen to them. I'm going to get a hold of Scott on the Game Drive channel. Oh, Scott, sorry, go again with your message. Copy that, thanks, Scott. Scott's just letting me know he's doing another loop of the ruler area. And whilst he does that, I'm going to head back to where we had visual of Kunuma, or theoretically Kunuma. But this is just such a beautiful sky.
I'm just watching this elephant bull following behind. You can see that enormous size difference because that female on the right was not a small cow. But he, male elephants are just so much bigger than females. Okay, I think it's time for us to leave these Ellie's. And while I do, I'll answer Kat's question. Kat, you're watching all the way from Nebraska. Welcome to the Sunset Safari. You've asked a question I don't really know the answer to, but it's a really good question, so I'm going to pose it to the audience. I mentioned that babies have milk teeth and that they then grow a permanent set to replace them. Better come around this corner very carefully in case there's some stragglers around. Oh, cats, we're wondering if the milk teeth fall out before the babies get their permanent ones. The answer is yes, they do. But whether or not something like hyena would find them and use them to supplement their diet, I don't know. I guess it is a distinct possibility. I'm trying to think. I suppose it's the same as bones. There's plenty of calcium in teeth, and that is what tusks are. They're just teeth. But you hardly ever see skulls with teeth chewed by hyenas. So obviously the calcium content isn't quite the same. Hmm. Oh, look! It's our mantid friend. And he's gone. <laughs> I'm not sure if you even saw that. Our, our mantis from earlier was sitting on the dashboard and just flew off to find maybe a more suitable tree. I guess the bits of debris weren't cool enough for it. Okay, let me untangle my spotlight. Oh, it would be on the further side of the car. Maybe there. Alrighty. I'm glad we got to spend a bit of time with those elephants. And we've had two different leopards, albeit very briefly, this afternoon. Let's go see if we can find Kanuma while Scott looks for Karula. Gosh, we've been spoiled. We really, really have. your eyes on the Juma Dam cab, as I said. He was heading in that direction. Uh, Scott's been doing a loop around the area head across to him and find out what he's been up to so that he can also say farewell at the end of his bushwalk. I will be back with you very shortly. So thankfully the elephants weren't around the vehicle when we got back to it. They were probably about 40 or 50 meters away and we just snuck in, got John Dre's backpack off but leave, left it powered up so that that's how we're broadcasting this footage to you now. We are on an abnormal vehicle, not back on one of the regular broadcast vehicles. And we're just going to play around and help the search or help to continue to search for Karula and keep searching for anything really until the end of the safari. So we're not going to leave Jamie out there all on her own. And as I continue on, it's going to be a little bit different to normal, the view you have, but let's try it out. And Gillian Wisconsin is interested to know a little bit more about how we feel when we're on foot with the elephants and whether we can actually hear or feel the rumblings that they let off when they call. And Gilly, even when you're in a vehicle, it's as if those vibrations are happening right underneath you from those rumbling growls that the elephants let out. It's an incredibly powerful noise, but you cannot, you, you cannot feel their footsteps or hear their footsteps, so that's not the case. 
Oh, it's taking a bit of getting used to, to driving this vehicle. I'm, I've gone back into the mode as if I was in a Land Rover, but that's not the case. Not the normal vehicle that I'm used to presenting in. There's also this high bar here that's preventing Chandra from getting a low angle, so I feel like a little schoolboy sitting as high as I can on my seat. Now, a few weeks ago, some of you will remember us finding Karula in a tree that James responded to. It wasn't far away at all from where we are now and while we were on foot we actually went and checked that tree to see if she wasn't sleeping in it again but that wasn't the case and I just want to get up onto the quarantine clearing so you'll just be with me for a few more minutes and like I said we are still going to stay out in search of any signs of life and we'll be sure to call you back to this vehicle if we do find anything but I will start saying some initial goodbyes in case you don't come back and in case we don't find you anything interesting thank you so much for joining on the bushwalk and for all your contributions along the way especially to, I've forgotten your name, but whoever helped me with that scapular bone or helped all of us with that scapular bone that was really really awesome that people around the world can contribute to this safari and I think that was Jade that, uh, that helped us out with that and also to Tara in the final control room along with Jerry and well done to Jamie for conducting the majority of this afternoon safari and I'm sure you've had a great time with her, she's a wonderful lady and lots of great shots she got you in position for for the leopard now a lot of you have noticed the tracker seats up ahead and are wishing that you could have a ride on it well it is certainly a lot of fun and I don't blame you. You do have to hold on though for dear life. We nearly lost Stefan off it the other day on just the, the smallest of little bumps. He kind of lost his balance and nearly went toppling off. And it's a great place to be seated and who knows, maybe if you make it out on safari one day you'll be able to go out on an adventure sitting up on the hood of the vehicle. Well, again, big, big thanks to everyone involved in the safari, from the crew here at Juma to our wonderful viewers all around the world. A massive, massive thank you and look forward to tomorrow's adventure. It's just Jamie and myself on the ground at the moment. I think James returns on Monday. We're not too sure exactly what we're going to be doing tomorrow yet, so maybe that'll be a surprise. We'll discuss that around the campfire this evening. and. Look forward to, like I said, another adventure on the Sunset Safari tomorrow. Don't forget, if you weren't tuned in this morning, it's half an hour earlier than normal, so 5 o'clock Central African time until 8 o'clock Central African time. Over to Jamie, and we'll possibly see you in a short while. A pack once again on the dam wall, scouring ever so carefully for Mr. Kunuma. I wonder if he's tucked away somewhere in this drainage line. These are the kind of days that you end exhausted but exhilarated with so many different things to see and concentrate on. It always feels you've been in the sun that's hot your eyes burn from the dust, but somehow there's no feeling in the world that matches a good day like today, or indeed any day out here. As we jigger myself and Tibbs, clunk our way back over the top of the dam wall. For all jiggers had possibly 
even more an exhausting day than I have. I keep checking that back right wheel because I've definitely got a slow puncture there. I didn't escape my off-roading escapades unscathed. I guess it was a bit much to expect to. Scrub heads, please don't run into the road. There we go. greatest spotted cuckoos uh, cuckoos earlier and Joan you're watching in England now Joan tells me that in Spain and Portugal in their summer months so in our winter months they parasitize the azure winged magpies in that area and then Joan was wondering if that is the case do they breed here does that mean they breed twice in one year which some species do Joan, I'm thinking, the wheels in my head are furiously turning because as far as I know, the greatest spot of cuckoos that we see are intra-African migrants. Not European, but maybe they spread up to that part of the area. Or maybe it's only the, oh, I don't know. I think I'm in a time, I, I've run the risk of tying myself in knots here. I'll have to look into it further, Joan. I honestly don't know the answer to that. And that's why I appreciate hearing so many of the views from the different viewers because you've got knowledge in areas where we don't travel to or we don't know. And then you make us think. It's interesting. It could well be a species that breeds twice in a year. I don't know. Barbara, I'm sorry to hear that you missed that cuckoo sighting. You wanted to know what happens to babies when they are forced out of the nest. I'm assuming you're talking about the babies of the host species. Um, sometimes some species of cuckoo will kick the host eggs out, bugs the eye, the host eggs out. Um, other times they will, the chick is actually quite well armed even when it's, it attaches. It maintains that egg tooth that all chicks have. It maintains that and it uses them to terrorize and knock the baby birds of the host species out of the nest. So they can be serious bullies. And some cuckoos opt for a different technique which is just to outcompete the other chicks because they tend to be bigger, they're faster, or not bigger, they're faster growing. Um, and they usually parasitize species that are smaller than them. So they can outcompete them in that way. Definitely an interesting one. One has to wonder what it is, and I know there's a lot of studies being done into it. Because quite a few evolutionary biologists are now saying that the host species is not tricked into thinking that that offspring is their offspring. They know full well that it's a cuckoo baby. So why do they continue to look after it all the way to adulthood? Is it because their parenting instinct is so strong? I know that there are certain species of cuckoo, I can't remember which off the top of my head, but there are certain species of cuckoo that are demonstrate almost like a mob or a mafia type threatening behavior. So the adults lay it in the nest of the host species and if the host does kick the egg out or doesn't look after the chick, the cuckoo parents then respond by either knocking the host's own eggs out of the nest or killing their young, the host's young, which is phenomenally fascinating behavior. I'll have to read more about it. It's, something that, it's a topic that I've brushed on but not gone into too much depth. 
but a lot of questions remain unanswered about the nature of cuckoos and why they are the way they are. sighting garnered as much excitement as I felt about the whole process. I was positively bouncing up and down in my seat. So for James, I mentioned earlier that it was a new one to add to all of the viewers bird lists. That makes James's bird list 218, which is fantastic to hear. And for B. Wilson, you were glad that you had a little bit of a size comparison because you've seen them before on the damn camera, but always thought that they were much smaller. I always forget how big cuckoos can actually be. There's, there's three of the species that we get around here that are actually fair-sized birds. The Jacobins, the lesser striped, which is now known as the... Oh, this is... Either the Nevalence or the Levelance, depending on who you ask and who's pronouncing it. And then the greater spotted cuckoo that we see today, or that we saw today. And both of those species are considerably bigger than we expect, even I expect them to be, and I've seen them a lot of times. Every time they return, I get a surprise. They're bulky birds. One of the theories that was put forward, I mentioned while we were sitting watching those cuckoos, is that cuckoos, or part of a big part of their diet, is hairy caterpillars. So caterpillars were those very itch-inducing little spikes on their backs and on their sides. Something that South African children always know to avoid from a very early age. And something you learn the hard way if you didn't, because they itch like crazy if you didn't touch your skin. They leave all those tiny, tiny, almost microscopic hairs embedded in your skin. But supposedly the cuckoo parasitizes nests because it focuses, its diet focuses on hairy caterpillars and so it cannot feed its young that diet because the young is not um, equipped to deal with that level of discomfort from a food source. But that doesn't make any sense because the black-headed oriole and the Eurasian oriole that we see, they also feed on hairy caterpillars. There's no reason why that bird couldn't just alter its food source that it feeds its babies. a bit about deformities in animals. We get to a, a second subject that's also on the genetic line, and that is whether or not we ever get any crossbreeding out in the bush. And that question comes from Sharon, who's watching us all the way in Pittsburgh. Sharon, we don't get much crossbreeding from the antelope species. Um, you'd probably find that the subspecies, although there's a lot of questions about that, so say the subspecies of giraffe could interbreed, but in this particular case we only really get the naturally occurring one subspecies, which is the savannah giraffe. I'm trying to think if there's any other example. Oh, brakes are squeaky. Sharon, I don't think so. I can't think of a specific example. Mongoose don't crossbreed, as far as I know. I've certainly never heard of it happening. The cats don't crossbreed. The rhino species don't crossbreed, even though, of course, they're both known as rhino. They're very, very different species. Most things are actually too genetically distinctive in this particular area to crossbreed. What you do get is rare recessive coloration and interesting looking creatures, such as black-faced impala and golden uh, wildebeest, something that pops through every now and again, just like the white lion's genetically recessive gene 
shows itself every couple of generations. Now that white-faced mongoose that we saw the other day, I can't find an answer. It, it, it doesn't help that my access to internet is limited. But I can't find an answer about it. So what I've done is I've sent an email to a friend of mine who's been working on dwarf mongoose research for the last three years in an area that I used to work on. And I want to see if she's got any feedback for us and if she's ever, in, indeed, if she's ever seen it. So thank you for those of you, if you are watching, who sent me the screenshots of that mongoose. They've been passed on to the experts in the dwarf mongoose field. And yes, there are experts in dwarf mongoose behavior. And I've sent them through questions about it. Let's find out if we can get some answers. Done another big loop. Oh, Jigo wanted to jig to the left. Checking really carefully in this drainage line. Now, of course, we pass under lots of big trees, and there was a question that was asked to Scott earlier from Janine. Janine wanted to know whether he's ever experienced a snake dropping out of a tree into his car. Uh, I haven't either, as far as I know. I don't know. That's, that's a stupid thing to say. Of course I know I haven't had a snake drop into my car. One thing I have had happen though, and it's happened to me twice, was a snake that was hunting a frog whilst I was sitting around a swimming pool. And all of a sudden this frog plopped out of nowhere into the pool followed by a snake that had lost its balance and landed, you know those belly flops? It sounds like that, but smack on concrete. And I could not actually believe, I suppose snakes are structured so differently, that the snake immediately looked at us, and it might have been my imagination, but I think he looked a little bit embarrassed and promptly shot off into the bushes, but I must say that did give me a surprise. This was back when I first started living in the bush. And that's since happened to me another time as well. Snake hunting frog, frog launches in desperation into swimming pool, followed by a snake falling out of a tree. They do fall out of trees. It does happen. It has happened to me in the past. that came through about whether or not milk teeth when they fall out oh hello <laughs> um we're going to sit in the dark now there's there's quite a big herd of elephants coming down the road which is useful because we can continue talking they're not coming down in any threatening way i'm just not going to drive towards them i'm going to let them come to us and walk around us and enjoy their peaceful gentle giant presence and in the meantime, follow up on that question we were asked about milk teeth. The question was, milk teeth, if they fall out, will hyena eat them? And Barbara has sent us some info saying she believes that teeth are the only thing that hyena won't eat. For the most part, that's true. I have seen pups chewing on them. And I don't know whether that's a curiosity thing. So exploring with their mouths is not really an, an eating thing so much as a what is this I want to experiment with it learning experience and that could also be <laughs> it's amazing I can barely see anything in front of me but I can definitely see a backwards facing tusk facing sideways it's very dark what are you doing Eddie's if you stopped Oh, as they slowly lumber towards us, I've turned off all of my lights so that we don't bug them at all. And it's quite actually really nice to sit and listen to the footsteps coming up towards us. And Rachel, you're watching in New Jersey. Rachel, you wanted to know how much does an elephant eat in a day? A big male can eat up to 300 kilograms. That's about 
650 pounds odd. What are you up to, baby? I see you in the dark there. So about 650 pounds a day. Interestingly enough, he will then excrete, so he'll then defecate out about half of that. One of the most ineffective digestive systems out here. Um, in terms of a cow, she probably eats about 100 kilograms less, maybe 50 kilograms if she's a big cow. So you're looking at about 200 to 250 kilograms, 400 to 500 pounds of food in a day. It's a lot of eating. But I suppose if you eat constantly, it's very easy to do. I actually can't start my vehicle now. There's a little baby and a couple of very big elephants moving along. Possibly to be silhouetted against the sky soon. I might just be quiet for a moment so you can hear them rustling. You guys hear that? Crunching off in the dark. And sitting in the blackness like this, I can only just see their outlines around us. And for the most part, all I can hear is this very soft treading sound of their feet on the grass, just scuffing the dirt slightly and then of course the destruction of the tree that's happening off to my left. Those are the serious crunching sounds that you're hearing. And now of course the smell. Quite the experience just being surrounded by elephants at night and listening to their footsteps coming through. Now I know that Gilly, you spoke to Scott earlier and you asked him if when you're on foot with them, can you feel their footsteps? Ooh, that's a gecko. See if it starts again. Sorry Gilly, I'll be with you now. That's probably one of the first geckos I've heard shouting for the summer months. Maybe the rain really is on its way. Right, so Gilly, you asked if Scott, when you're on foot, if you can feel the vibrations of their footsteps, all the rumbles that they make. And the answer is yes, you can. I have experienced it before. And it is a very special feeling. Um, not so much their footsteps as their rumbles. I'd say their footsteps, you don't really feel the vibrations, you just hear them. Um, you'd have to be very close to feel those vibrations, probably a little bit too close to be on foot with them. And I think we can probably move now. We appear to have escaped the worst of the, not the worst of the elephants, but most of the elephants. There also appears to be a vehicle on its way behind us. So I'm going to start moving out of their way as well. I'm going to keep my side lights off for the moment. Ooh, there's definitely elephants everywhere still. attention to the elephants on either side of us. I'm going to just move out of the way of this vehicle because it's coming right up behind me. Let it come through. Cheers guys. <laughs> Always, but good day. We've lost Karula once again, and Granny, Billy Joe, who's 
been watching our shows for a very, very long time and is very familiar with our beloved ruler. You wanted to know why I call her why I call her sneaky or why I refer to her as sneaky because you've been watching her for years and she's never really been like that. Um a couple of reasons. One is that she consistently, I would say, has managed to give me the slip. And I think that probably says more about me than it does about her. But I have noticed in the time that I've been here, there are times when she clearly does not want to be seen. And I don't know if it's necessarily because she's experienced um, hunts that haven't gone and she wants to go places. That's just been my experience with Karula in the last four months. Her, the sightings for the most part have been brief. <coughs> Luckily we had Tebs and his fantastic spotting on the back. I'm glad that as the summer months have arrived and we've got these amazing birds coming and returning back to South African shores, Lynn, uh, try that again. Lynn, you were saying that your Christmas wish list will include a bird book on the birds we get here. I'm very happy to hear it. They're often something that's overlooked but are incredible and so beautiful and so fascinating. There is so much to learn about birds. I'm glad to hear that you've been inspired by our birding safaris. And guys, please don't forget that we have shifted our time up half an hour earlier in the morning. Only in the morning, not in the afternoon. We are out at 5 a.m. Central African time, which is 10 p.m. Eastern time. I know for a lot of you that makes your night slightly earlier. You don't have to go to bed quite so late. I'm afraid that Karula has snuck away, at least from me, and I wish her all the best in her hunting endeavours in the drainage line. Perhaps we'll catch up with her for the sunrise safari, or perhaps we'll catch up with Kanuma. You'll just have to join us to find out. Big thanks to Tebs for his great camera work, as well as to Tara and Nikki in FC, and of course, as always, to you guys for your questions and for making me think about the wonderful things we see.